from a young age, we have a desire to have heroes, whether it's our moms or dads, or maybe firefighters, or characters we see in movies, we all love heroes. They have qualities that we wish we could emulate. Uh, We even have heroes in the Bible. We call them heroes of faith. Maybe we want the faith of Moses, or the wisdom of Joseph, or the strength of the shepherd boy David who killed the giant Goliath. Maybe the perseverance of someone like the Apostle Paul. And sometimes these characters seem larger than life, almost unattainable to us. We look at them and we say, uh, we forget that they were actually real people with real struggles because we just see sometimes the amazing things that they had done. And we think my life could never measure up to that. But the Bible is full of characters who don't get the same kind of press as a Peter or a David. And this morning, we're going to begin a series called Unsung Heroes. We're going to look at different characters in the Bible over the next few weeks that maybe don't get the same press, don't have as many verses written about them. Maybe we don't look at them and they don't immediately think that's a giant of the faith. But these men and women who made an amazing difference for the kingdom, ordinary men and women, much like us, that have made a difference for the kingdom. And so today we're going to look at our first unsung hero. Her name is Lydia. Lydia. Now, you might not be familiar with the story of Lydia. We're going to hear that in just a moment. And I thought, because it's Mother's Day, uh, we don't want to give moms the day off, right? So I have asked uh, my lovely wife to join me up here this morning. Many of you have spent time uh, under Angie and have heard some of her lessons that she's done on women of the Bible. And so would you guys welcome this morning my beautiful wife, Angie Bruce. (laughs) Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thanks for helping us out this morning. Sure. So before we get going, I want us to just get a little context of who Lydia is. And so if you've got your Bibles, if you would turn to Acts chapter 16, uh, it's going to be important for us to, to camp out there this morning in Acts chapter 16. And a little bit of background here. We find uh, in Acts chapter 16 that Paul is traveling around on his missionary journeys. And so uh, Paul, who was once Saul, uh, this character who was working against the kingdom of God, against Jesus uh, and, and his message, the gospel message, was converted to Christianity, met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and is now going around, literally around the world. He's taking the Great Commission to places that have never heard about Jesus before. And when we start reading in verse 6 of chapter 16, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Persia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And then it says they go to all these different places and they're going back and forth to this. And it says in verse nine, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. And so what we see happening here in chapter 16 is the Holy Spirit making a divine appointment for Paul. All right. So we don't have but a few verses to tell us about Lydia. But when we first meet her, we find that she's one of the movers and shakers in the city of Philippi, which was in Greece and under Roman rule. So this was a city that was so desirable that everybody wanted to be there. Even the upper echelons of the Roman soldiers were encouraged to even retire there. This was the place to be. Um, So Lydia was originally from Thyatira in Turkey, which was known for its exclusive and very expensive purple dyes. So these kinds of colors were the best of the best. They were worn by royalty and only the wealthiest people could even afford it. So Thyatira was also home to the worship of a lot of pagan gods. It was known for its trade guilds, guilds, and it was highly likely that Lydia was a member of the one that was connected to the textiles and the purple dyes. And these trade guilds, uh, they were organizations that, that had the secrets to these trades, but there also was something really sinister about them. And they, uh, they often mostly worshipped pagan gods. 
a, a lot of them with, with sexual things that they were doing. And, and it was, an, it was uh, these organizations that weren't just about business, but were about idol worship as well. Mm-hmm. And so, so Lydia here is stepping into, and she's most likely part of one of these trades, uh, and she's being bombarded by this kind of culture that she's having to deal with. Yeah. So from there, she takes her business savvy to this more metropolitan area, right? And she starts a thriving business. She knew exactly where to go to make the big bucks. And apparently she was making a killing. So being a dealer of a high ticket item in a really big city seems to have made Lydia a very wealthy woman. We never hear of a husband or a father in Lydia's household which is really unusual because they lived in a very patriarchal culture. So that tells us that she's independently wealthy and she's able to support herself all on her own. We see evidence of how wealthy she was and that she has her own home. And it's one that's large enough that she's able to host Paul and all of his fellow travelers, which included Silas and likely Timothy and Luke as well, and maybe even more. So, um, It tells us in verse 13 that Paul and all of his group went outside the city gate to the river, expecting to find a place of prayer. So So do you want to read that part for us? Let's read that together. I'm going to start in verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed. Actually, I'm going to skip that. We'll go back to 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And then there's this section of Paul and Silas spending some time in prison. And we're going to skip down to verse 40. After Paul and Cyrus came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. So see, it tells us in verse 13 that Paul and his company, they went outside the city gate to find a place to pray down by the river. And Paul, remember, is here in this area in Philippi that is not a Jewish area. It's, uh, it's a Gentile territory. And so Lydia here is not uh, a Jewish woman, and really none of the people around are Jewish. And so Paul goes there. Remember, he got this prompting from the Holy Spirit uh, to meet this man from Macedonia. And what he finds is a group of women. And uh, Paul, he's walking around looking for maybe the people that he should be preaching to. And normally, if Paul entered a Jewish city, he would go to the synagogue and he would teach. But here in Thyatira or in uh, Philippi, the, the synagogue had not been yet established. Uh, in that time period, it took 10 men to create the synagogue. And so there are not 10 believers there in Philippi. But Paul does meet these women by the river. So Paul sat down and he began to speak to the women who were gathered there. And one of them was Lydia. And verse 14 tells us that she was a worshiper of God, which was a way for us to understand that she was a Gentile who was believing in God, but she hadn't heard the rest of the story. She hadn't yet heard about Jesus, the good news. So Paul started sharing the gospel to this small group of women down by the river who had not heard about Jesus. He didn't wait. Paul didn't wait for 10 men to come together to open up a synagogue. He used the people that were right in front of him and he taught the women. And what was the result? It says, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive the good news and she believed. So God opened her heart so she could believe. Does that mean that God made her believe? So what does that mean that he opened her heart? Well, we know that Lydia already loved God, but she hadn't heard the rest of the story yet. She didn't know the part about Jesus. She loved God, and when she heard what Paul had to say, God opened her already open heart even further so that she knew what she was hearing was true. And then she believed it. Her faith was such, and she was so influential to the people around her, 
that she and all of the rest of the members of her household were baptized. And the cool thing is that even though Paul went to Philippi looking for a man, Lydia was the first person to believe and respond to the good news in all of Europe. She believed and she told her family, her servants, the members of her household, and all of them believed as well. She went home and she taught the good news that she had been taught. She immediately became a disciple who made other disciples. And like we've talked about before, a disciple is somebody who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. So we see Lydia follow Jesus right away, and she's set on fire. She's changed, and she tells everybody that she knows. She's immediately on mission with him. And by the end of the chapter, it seems as though the number of believers had grown even beyond her household. Yeah, we see that uh, Paul and Silas, as we just read here in, uh, later on in this chapter, they end up going to prison, uh, but they went straight to Lydia's house right after they got out, before they moved to a different city, because Lydia's house had now become the church the first church there in Europe, a place where they were meeting in her home, a large group of believers, of new believers. We actually see in the next chapter uh, that there is a jailer. Many of you guys know the story of the jailer who was converted and his family. And, and it says here in the verse, I don't know if you noticed this as we read it, but it says the phrase used to describe the believers that Paul and Silas left the jail and went to Lydia's home to encourage the brothers and sisters. So Paul, who had started sharing the good news with Lydia and these group of women, in a short period of time, there were now brothers and sisters. The church had grown. She had told the people around the area there the good news of Jesus. And she started this church that was now full of life. Lydia's witness was bringing a diverse group of people together under this shared faith in Jesus Christ. And another thing that's also noteworthy, that aside from Paul and Silas, Lydia is the only other person who's actually named in this chapter. None of the other women that Paul spoke to at the river were named. Nobody else in Lydia's household was named. The jailer and his family aren't named. And none of the other brothers and sisters that make up the body of believers that met in her home were named. So that also gives us a clue as to her prominence and her importance in that day. So what can we learn from Lydia? She was a wealthy woman who had worked really hard to build a thriving and profitable business. Yet, what do we see her doing on the day that Paul meets her? She was observing the Sabbath. She wasn't working. She was meeting with the other women who loved God and she was resting and she was praying. She trusted God enough to take the day off, to be with him and to be with others that worshiped him. So how do we follow that example? Especially in light of today, Mother's Day, how do those of us who are moms do this? Especially, we don't really get a time off from motherhood, do we? <laughs> so how do we rest, take a day off, and just be with God and our family? It's hard, isn't it? The world tells us to keep going all the time. We can't miss X, Y, or Z, or our kid has to be on this team or in this activity, or they'll never be able to do those things in high school and college, even if they're still only six. <laughs> Some of us are juggling kids and a full-time job. So how do we take that time off and teach our kids and our families to do the same? Sometimes it just looks like working extra hard on a Friday night to get the house reset after a long and crazy week so that we can rest together the next day. Sometimes it looks like just leaving the dishes there and playing or reading with the kids anyway, or letting them see you sit down and do something that you enjoy. Sometimes it looks like them watching you have coffee with a friend and enjoying the deeper conversations of life. But whatever it is, they need to see us stop and slow down and enjoy finding joy and peace in the things that God has given us and giving thanks to him and trusting him that anything that remains undone will still be there tomorrow. So for those of us who may not have kids yet, it looks like putting those practices into place now so that by the time you do start thinking about having a family, those habits are already in place. 
So we see Lydia stopping and honoring the Sabbath. Now, I doubt the Gentile city of Philippi had slowed down on the Sabbath. Trade was likely still occurring inside the city gates. But Lydia's trust was in a different place. She trusted God to sustain and support her, even if she didn't work on a day that everyone else was. Yeah, that's so hard for not just moms, but for all of us, I think, uh, to stop and to, to trust that God is in control and he's going to take care of the things around us. Uh, and so here's this, this incredibly uh, profitable and incredibly successful businesswoman. When everyone else is working, she's stopping and listening and being with God. And in that divine moment that Paul uh, learned about, that the Holy Spirit told him about that was going to happen, uh, it changed Lydia's life. It ended up changing your life as well. Because this, the, this European church, this first church started and grew because of this woman's willingness to take a moment, to stop, and to listen. So what are something else that we learn from Lydia? We see that not everyone that we share the good news with is going to immediately accept it. I'm with Lydia. It says that she already had an idea of who God was because she was a worshiper of God, but she didn't know the full story. And verse 14 is an important verse here. It says that the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Now, we don't read about what was happening with the other women that were there. Uh, maybe she was the only one in that moment who believed. We don't know. But we do know why she believed. Because God had prepared her heart to hear his good news. And we can trust that God is working in the hearts of the people around us, even when we don't always see it, or even when we might be sharing the good news or living that life and them not accept it immediately. I mean, to Paul's credit, he didn't walk around and say, I can't do anything here. Uh, there's not the men of the city uh, that are here to, to, to worship the Lord. He went and found those women that were receptive, that were willing to listen. And that's a takeaway for us as well in this encounter with Lydia, that Paul was willing to go and look for the people who were ready to hear the message. Right. So if we try to have a spiritual conversation Sometimes it seems like it's falling on deaf ears, doesn't it? So what we can take away from that is maybe they're just not ready to hear it yet. Perhaps there's some work that God still needs to do in their heart and in their mind before they're able to follow him fully or even at all. We have to remember that it's his work that we're participating in, but only he can work at that heart level. For those of you that have either grown up in church or have been in church for a long time, there are probably some stories that you've heard that seems like the million, um, like a million times that you've heard them. But sometimes on that millionth plus one, how do you say that? M a million and once. once? <laughs> sometimes something just clicks differently, doesn't it? And it hits you and you're like, oh, now I get it. Or now I get it in a different way. So that's God opening your heart and your mind to hear something from him in his word or hear something in a way that hits you differently in the particular season that you're in. And he does the same with other people as well. We can trust that he's working on the people around us just like he's working in us, even if he might not be, be doing the same things in each of us at the same time. We can also learn that things don't always look like what we expect. Even after a call from God, even when you feel and sense that God is asking you to do something specific, mm -hmm. and that's definitely been, in the, been the case in our many years of ministry, yeah. the call was there, but it didn't look anything like what we expected. Yeah, I, I've shared this with some of you before, but we, we have moved here recently, about a year and a half, almost two years ago from Wisconsin. And uh, when I took the job there in Wisconsin, I, I had, we had a call from God. That, that he had called us to this next ministry, but it, it ended up not being at all what we expected. I went there assuming uh, and, and thinking that I was gonna working behind the scenes uh, with the worship team and the tech ministry and communications and different things. And uh, through what ended up being probably the most difficult season of ministry that we've ever had, uh, we ended up, I ended up being in a completely different role there, part of the teaching team and, and leadership in a way that I never expected to be at that church. And that's happened to us time and time again. Yeah. And we found that 
even though it didn't look like what we thought, that God had a purpose for us mm. being there. And after some time of doing our best to be faithful in spite of the difficulty, difficulty that we found, God worked it all out, and we can now look back on that time with gratitude and even fondness. Previous to that even, we got a very clear sign years ago that a move to Illinois was in God's plan for us. And we agreed to take a significant pay cut to go there that only worked if our house sold. And we never expected that it would be two years of us shouldering an out-of-state mortgage on a lesser salary that made it so we couldn't afford it anymore. But God worked that out too, and he carried it through us in miraculous ways. Things often don't play out as we expect. So if we look back to verse nine, Paul actually had a dream of a man from Macedonia calling him to come. But when he arrived, there weren't even enough Jewish men to form a synagogue. So he could have wandered around the country looking for the man who had beckoned him to come, but he didn't. Interestingly, his Macedonian man ended up being a group of women gathered to pray and worship together. The Jewish rabbis back then had a saying that it was better that the words of the law be burned than given to a woman. But who do we see Paul giving the good news in this story to? Yeah, women. women, yeah. Lydia becomes the first Christian in Europe and she starts a home church in the most unlikely of places. We see that Paul taught her, baptized her, and then stayed with her for a while, surely teaching her more and more each day. And her faithfulness brought others to the Lord. The responsibility that we carry, that Paul carried, that Lydia carried, is faithfulness, not results. Our responsibility is faithfulness, not results. Because as we see with Lydia, God can do a lot with even just one faithful woman. Lastly, we see in Lydia's life that she lived a life of generosity. She lived her life with open hands. Immediately, she invited Paul and all of his traveling companions into her home. And then she invited the newly formed church to also meet in her home. We mentioned earlier that Lydia had, Lydia had no husband or father that we know about to help support her. So we have no idea what her life or her family situation looked like. But what we can also take note of is that Lydia likely had no children either. Perhaps that was something that she longed for in her life and it just wasn't panning out as she had hoped, or perhaps that was something that she dreamed about. But another part of, story, of Lydia's story that's beautiful is that even though she doesn't appear to have a husband or children, by the end of her story, the Lord has filled her home with love mm -hmm. and with a family of a different kind. So there's hope in that for all of us. God provides us with that kind of family, regardless of our situation, through his children. So even though Lydia may not have had biological children, she was a mother. We see that she was a spiritual mother to the church that Paul planted with her that day. She grew and she learned, and then she trained up others after her, and they grew. So she was faithful and she was generous, and God gave her a spiritual family to share both with. Yeah. And if we read the introduction of, of Paul's letter to the Philippian church, we, we see that he's actually now writing this uh, to this church that was started in Lydia's home. Uh, these men and women became faithful Christians and they followed Lydia's example of generosity. Uh, throughout the, the Philippians chapter four, Paul talks about uh, how they were the only church that supported him in his time of need. And at one point he actually says, and I need you to, to stop giving, to stop being so generous because you're giving me so much. And so the, the seed that was sown in Lydia's heart of generosity, of opening her home, uh, it bled over to the rest of that church. And that church became Paul's main source of support. Uh, they were generous and they sent more than enough. See, the church continued on in Lydia's example of open sharing, of having open hands from the very beginning. And Paul, in the opening of the letter, he calls them partners in the gospel from day one, he said. And that's our goal, 
That's what we need to be. That's what we can take away. One of the lessons we can take away from Lydia is to be partners in the gospel, to be working with God for what he has in store for this community, for our homes, for our families, and for the world. Yeah. Paul says they were partners in the gospel from day one. Lydia was the Philippian church's day one. Mm -hmm. He prays that the Lord who began a good work in her and in them would carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Like Stephen talked about last week, Paul is praying for their sanctification. Mm -hmm. He's praying that the good work that God began in her would carry on to completion, that she would be sanctified, that she would look more like Jesus, and that the same would be carried on throughout the generations of the church that she helped begin, that their sanctification, that their discipleship, would eventually reach completion. Yeah, so that's the amazing story of this unsung hero, Lydia, who took time from her busy life to have her priorities right and meet God, to hear about the saving work of Jesus Christ, and then open her home to build the church, to start the church. And so we're so grateful for women like Lydia who have stepped out in faith, uh, who have gone against the culture, gone against the, the things that they might be bombarded with and, and open their home and their hearts to hear the message of Jesus and to live it out. And what a great message for us today. Uh, our culture, we might not have trade guilds that are full of these idolatrous, uh, rebellious uh, organizations, but we live in a world that is working counterculturally to what Christ has called us to. And we too can step out no matter what our circumstances might be and be that shining light. And just taking that moment to stop and listen and to wait for the Lord could be the opportunity that God is opening a door that's going to, in this case, and in our case, I think as well, can change the world. We don't know the power of those moments that we're in if we just look for what God has called us to. Uh, and he says that he will carry it out to completion that's the prayer that he prays for us, that through us, the gospel will be brought to completion, that we're able to spread the good news of Jesus to here in Jackson County and around the world. I want to read Philippians 1, 3 through 6 over us as we end today. Mm -hmm. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for including Lydia and her story in your word. Thank you for the example that she sets for us of leadership, faithfulness, and generosity. We pray the same prayer that Paul prayed for the Philippian church over all of us here now, that you would carry on the good work that you started in each of us through to its completion, mm -hmm. to our maturity and to our sanctification so that we look more and more like Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen.